She is an award-winning journalist, syndicated columnist, and author of the international bestsellers, This Changes Everything, <laughs> The Shock Doctrine, and No Logo. She writes a regular column for The Nation and The Guardian and is a contributing editor at Harper's. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Naomi Klein. <laughs> this piece is called uh, No One Saw Anything. It's about a young woman named Bella. That's her up there. On July 20th, 2013, Bella Labucan McLean fell 31 stories off the balcony of a condo tower in downtown Toronto. She had been at a small gathering inside one of the building's many glass boxes. There were five other people in the condo that night. A resident of a lower floor heard the sound of her body falling and alerted the police. Bella was 25 years old, Cree from Northern Alberta. The police deemed her death suspicious, I'll say. Five people besides Bella in an 800 square foot condo, all of Bella's belongings still inside, purse, wallet, shoes, phone. Yet for 12 hours after her deadly fall, no one in the apartment calls the police. It is not until the building is crawling with cops going door to door, trying to identify the body of that beautiful young woman, that one of those five people picks up the phone to report Bella missing. Everyone who is there claims they saw nothing knows nothing. No one will be a witness. And yet, despite finding these accounts highly implausible, the police put out no media advisory. It was two weeks before a single story appeared in the Toronto media about Bella's death. I can't make anybody talk, the investigating detective told the Toronto Star. A year and a half later, the police have found out exactly nothing about what went on that night. The family insists Bella would never have intentionally harmed herself, that she had no history of depression, no drug problems, left no note. The case remains open. Six months before her death, Bella had been at my house eating thin crust pizza laughing with her big sister Melina, making faces at my seven-month-old. I Don't Know More was rocking the country and Bella was energized. She talked excitedly about making t-shirts for the movement. She was studying fashion at Humber. Her plan was to become a designer, combining traditional Cree artwork with her own modern flair. She graduated soon after. Her dreams, as her family said, within arm's reach. She danced at powwows and beaded. She went to clubs and Instagrammed. She was part of an indigenous cultural resurgence, a moment of awakening. We held a memorial for Bella at the windy base of the building where she fell one week after her death. A group of about 40 of us joined in a circle. We put up pictures of Bella on a concrete wall, confident, vulnerable, glowing from within. We clutched red roses, white candles, little bags of tobacco. Bella's body had just been returned to her family in Peace River, Alberta. They were, at that moment, beginning the process of laying her to rest. But according to custom, there needed to be a spirit release ceremony at the place where she died to free Bella to continue her journey. So there we were, two distant points on Turtle Island, connected invisibly by Bella and the sound of drums, the smell of sage, it was Micmac elder Wanda Whitebird who led the ceremonies. 
with help from other community members. All had performed too many such rituals of public mourning before. Wanda smiled warmly at Bella's impossibly young, fresh-faced college friends. She explained that we should all take our bags of tobacco home and sprinkle them somewhere where they would feed the life cycle, a garden, a body of water, a potted plant. Not here though, she said. Nothing grows in this place. I think that most of you know this place. It's that part of our city that feels like no place. The official name is City Place. The barrage of glass on glass condo towers bracketed by the Rogers Center to the east, the train tracks to the north, Fort York Boulevard to the south. The street where Bella died didn't exist five years earlier, neither did the building from which she fell. It's not the density of this part of our city that's strange. It's the monotony of all that newness, the born yesterdayness. The streets and buildings are all about the same age. Most of the people, the same age too. The same tax bracket too. Even the token plant life scrawny saplings and sparse bushes all seem to have been planted last week. More than 11,000 people make their home in this community, as City Place calls itself. But many who live there remark that something is missing, that something being community. Some complain that their neighbors won't meet their eye, that they push the door close button on the elevator when they hear footsteps. The developers make considerable efforts to fill this nagging absence with outdoor yoga and Zumba classes, with a farmer's market, with a City Fest Got Talent contest sponsored by Molson Canadian and Uber. A block from where Bella died is a brand new $8 million green space called Canoe Landing Park, filled with broad strokes markers of Canadiana an oversized fake de beaver dam, bright fishing bobbers, that electric red canoe that looks like it's about to launch itself into the Gardner Expressway. These nautical pieces of urban furniture designed by Douglas Copeland are meant to connect the city to the world that was here before the concrete was poured. Remind us that this land used to slope gently down to the lake where people used to canoe, fished, and trapped. Yet it is striking that a park that purports to link Canadians to their past makes no mention of the First Peoples, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, who actually paddled these waters as a way of life. At the opening ceremony for the new park, then City Councillor Adam Vaughan promised that it would become city places heart and soul. It's going to take more than a big red canoe. It is one of the most painful details of Bella's death, that her body fell not onto the street, but into the building's outdoor communal space, a terrace scattered with fancy barbecues and mesh furniture, a place meant to help residents meet their neighbors, to build community. Yet as we gathered to remember Bella, just one person asked us to tell them about the young woman who had died in their midst. Most walked their dogs right past us. Within an hour of the memorial, all the tributes to Bella, the pictures, flowers, and candles had been cleared away. The gray concrete returned to its clean blank state. Nobody saw anything again. I met Bella through her sister Melina Labuken Massimo, a dear friend. Melina is one of this country's most important and inspiring voices speaking out against the health and environmental impacts of the Alberta tar sands. Raising the alarm on tar sands development is personal for Melina. Her father's side of the family is Lubicon Cree and their traditional territory has been devastated by oil and gas infrastructure poisoned by pipeline spills. 
The first time we met, Melina described how more and more her father, Bella's father, was returning from hunting trips with animals whose flesh was yellowed and riddled with tumors. Two weeks before Bella died, I had been in the tar sands with Melina at the annual Tar Sands Healing Walk. The gathering is like nothing I've seen anywhere. Hundreds of people walk in silence for an entire day through an unimaginably scarred landscape by the sprawling open pit mines, by the massive tailing ponds that kill ducks on contact, stopping only for prayer and ceremony. Melina sees strong connections between the two very different kinds of violence that have so powerfully marked her life. Violence against Mother Earth is violence against women, she says. The two are inextricably linked. Here is one link for us to consider. The greatest barrier to our government's single-minded obsession with drilling, mining, and fracking the hell out of this country is the fact that indigenous communities from coast to coast are exercising their inherent and constitutional right to say no. Indigenous strength and power is a tremendous threat to that insatiable vision, and Indigenous women really are the heart and soul of their communities and movements. The trauma of sexual violence saps the strength of communities with terrifying efficiency. So let us not be naive. The Canadian government has no incentive to heal and strengthen the very people it sees as its greatest obstacle. Justice, when it comes, will be demanded, not granted. Last week, Melina came to Toronto for work. She said she was ready to see where Bella had died. The night before, I warned her that it was a very unwelcoming place, all hard surfaces and sharp edges. I told her what Wanda had said about nothing growing. But then something beautiful happened. It snowed all night, the first real snowfall of the year, fresh and fluffy. As we set out that morning, the city crawled instead of raced, whispered instead of roared. It even softened the hardness of that place. Melina said it reminded her of home. Audrey Huntley from No More Silence smudged and sang quietly. The Filipino security guard used a barbecue lighter to burn the sage. And Melina sat for the better part of an hour in the exact spot where Bella fell. She craned her neck to look up all 48 stories, snowflakes falling into open eyes. She grabbed handful after handful of snow until her hands were red and raw. She wrote, I love you, next to Bella's name, in the powder. And she breathed one word into the snow-covered city, angry. A different word filled my head that day. Shame. Shame that this city had failed Bella. Shame that so many of us still aren't talking, at least not enough, are failing to be witnesses as fully as we can be to the ongoing catastrophe of murdered and missing Indigenous women. This night, is called a celebration of community in the face of violence. Because building community isn't just about outdoor yoga and farmer's markets. It's about coming together. It's about coming together to do the things that will allow us to look each other in the eye. That means helping each other to heal so that we can heal this land. It means honoring women and honoring treaties. And it means joining together 
to demand justice for the crimes that haunt this country. Thank you.